Hi, this is Claudia Filos. I'm with the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm recording remotely, and I'm here today talking with Leonard Milner, who's a professor of classical studies at Brandeis University. He's also um, the director of IT and publications at the Center for Hellenic Studies. And Lenny, thanks for joining me today for a short uh, discussion. What a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So today I was hoping we could just have a talk about something that. Um, some people may or may not know about is a, a topic called aspect, and this uh -huh. is something that might be interesting to people whether or not they have uh, an interest in, in learning ancient Greek language, but it might have uh, it might help us understand sort of poetry and myth in ancient Greek society in general. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and how it's okay. different from tense? So what we're talking about is, uh, and I hope you'll you'll interact with me about this. Okay? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is verbal aspect. How 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 um, there are markers on Greek verbs, on all Greek verbs, okay? Mm -hmm. um, there are markers for voice, like active and passive and middle, but there are also markers on aspect, which uh, the, is a kind of elusive concept, but um, in, in, and it can take various forms. In other words, in some language, languages, aspect is, uh, I, I can, I, you know, I heard this third hand from my cousin, as opposed to, um, I, I witness this, what I'm reporting to you myself, or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's in Greek, it's about the, the overall uh, thing at issue is whether you're, you're reporting action um, or you're describing action as an ongoing process or a completed one, or, and this is the, hard, the hardest part of it, or, or you're reporting action and not specifying whether it's a completed process or an ongoing one. Um, so that's super interesting, right? Yes. For us, I think. So, so the, the, I think the key thing for understanding how this three-part system works is to understand the categories uh, that were that were first uh, applied to language by the Prague School of Linguistics in the in the 30s and 40s. Um, and the big exponent that most of us have heard of of the Prague School of Linguistics is Roman Jakobson, but he was he, they, these people talked about when we think of oppositions, um, which are an important pe feature of we think of binary oppositions like one and zero, which are the pro built on that's what computers are built on, uh, where something has a property and the other thing doesn't have it. So our notion of most of oppositions is that they're 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 mutually exclusive oppositions, like black and white, or one and zero. Um, but the Prague School distinction betw is between what are what it calls marked categories and unmarked categories, mm -hmm. and uh, and and uh, so it, they're not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, um, the best examples of these sorts of uh, of oppositional pairs is like the, the opposition between, well, it, at least in, it, in, in its n most uh, unvarnished and maybe uh, to be amended form, the opposition between pants and skirts. So okay. you can say that, that uh, uh, pants are unmarked uh, mm -hmm. as in opposition to skirts because both males and females wear pants, okay. uh, whereas skirts are marked because Females and some Celtic people wear them. Uh, I mean, are restricted restricted to a certain group. Okay, so so from the it point of view, yes. or, or or the other example, which is the one that Greg uses, is the opposition between short and tall. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, w they're not really mutually exclusive because you can say of a of a short person, how tall are you? Okay. Right. In other words, there's a sense of tall, which is, doesn't really, it means how high are you, not whether you're tall or short, okay? Mm -hmm. So that it, it, it includes shortness and tallness, okay, in it. Um, the, right. other, the other, the other uh, way of thinking about this is uh, toll booths on the, on the on, uh, highways, where at least there used to be. Now everybody has electronic gadgets, but maybe most of the people in this audience know toll booths where you have one lane for um, passenger cars with exact change right? <laughs> and, and another lane for everyone, okay? Right. And most people think that if they have exact change, they, they should go in the exact change lane. But if you have exact change, you could go in the lane for everybody, right? right? It's not an exclusive category. It includes 
people with exact change, passenger mm -hmm. cars with exact change. So, so that's the basic idea. So, um, so it, just can I clarify? So the unmarked category can include the marked. Is that exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. So, so what you have in Greek in in aspects, and here are the names of them, um, is the imperfective aspect, which describes action that is imperfect that in the sense not that it's not perfect but that it's not complete in the okay. Latin sense of perfecto um, and then then you have uh, uh, and that includes the present and the and the imp the so-called imperfect tense which is just the past of the present um, these aren't cat the aspect is not a category that's it's a category that's totally distinct from tense okay right right yeah. So, so, uh, and I think the future belongs to the uh, category of the imperfect aspect. Um, and then, then you have the perfective aspect. So there's imperfective aspect and perfective aspect. And perfective aspect includes, in terms of indicative, at least, a perfect, perfect tense and pluperfect tense. Okay. Right. Which describe actions that are complete. So, so you know the 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 notion is that if you use the the perfect of the verb to die, it's a kind of grim example, but I think mm -hmm. it works okay. So, uh, the, the the imperfective aspect of of die is to be in the process of dying. Okay. Okay. Present or if it's imperfect, it's in the past. I was dying. Right. Um, but if you if you use it in the perfective sense, you're dead. Okay. Right. It means right now I am dead. And the blue for effect means in the sometime in the past I was dead. Okay. Right. Uh huh. So so there's a proverb in Greek which uses the well let, let, let's get to the proverb afterwards. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Anyhow, okay. So so um, I think these two categories are relatively comprehensible and we have we can we can express what they mean quite easily in English. And, right. And and the they they have to be enhanced a little bit because the for example in the case of the Greek perfect. It means that a process is complete, but it can also describe the state that obtains upon the completion of a process. Right. right? Like right. being dead. Dead. Okay. dead. Right. It's, I have died. Dead. Yeah. It, but it, it's. So it's a state, right? It it's, can a, be state. it's a state, or it's just that you've done it. You can, if you say I spoken in Greek in the perfect, it means you're finished and you're not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Okay. All right, so so you have those two, but the the tricky one is the so-called aorist, which is a, the Greek name for it, which is a uh, horispos. It was an H in there in Greek. Uh -huh. so, uh, uh is the negative uh, um, uh, prefix, as in uh, amoral and those things that survive in English. And the horistos, the English word that's cognate with it is horizon, um, uh -huh. which the horizon is the line that divides the the sky from the land or the sea, right? Uh -huh. So horizon in Greek means the divider, okay? Okay. So, so what a horistos means is undivided or undividing, okay? Okay. In other words, it doesn't make a distinction, okay? okay? Um, so in the terms that we were talking about before, yeah. that would be unmarked. Is that what you're okay. saying? Exactly. But here's the here's the tricky part. What you've got then is a three-part system. And what my examples of unmarked are only two-part. Uh, mm -hmm. Examples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think you can you can see how this works if you think of it as a triangle, okay? Right. As a triangle, <laughs> uh -huh. um, and at the top of the triangle, there, for example, there is the word lion, which means mm -hmm. which means a, a, a specific kind of animal. Um, when you use it, when I say a lion, it it doesn't specify its gender. It's it it's the, the lion as opposed to the lamb, let's say, or to to a wolf. Right, right. The category, okay, and it doesn't necessarily have gender, but if you put that that lion at the top of the triangle and at the bottom ends of it, you put lion on on one on one side mm -hmm. and lioness on the other. There's right. a sense of lion that means male lion, okay, mm -hmm. um, and there's another sense that means female. Then then it's in opposition to lioness. So so in a certain sense, that's the way the Greek aspects work. On the top, you have the aorist, okay, which is just uh, the category of an action, okay. okay. Yeah, and yeah. It doesn't specify whether it's ongoing or not. And then you have the two uh, uh, categories that are opposed to one another. So, so what's what's difficult is to appreciate what an aorist does in Greek. Right. Okay. Um, that's hard, and it and it does things that are. For example, you make can make proverbs in the Greek in Greek in the aorist. Right. 
because they have a kind of timelessness to them. Okay, that's one thing. But right. also they're, 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 they don't specify whether the action is ongoing or not. There, there are markers that are left out there, okay? Right, yeah. And we don't have this in English. Right, right? It's, it's totally different. But that's what's so fascinating yeah. to me, yeah. right? It's and a different really, way of, of communicating the yeah, ideas about exactly. what's happening in the world. Exactly. So, so the grammar books say, oh, you translate the aorist indicative as a simple past. Mm -hmm. And even the standard grammar book that we use, the uh, Hansen and Quinn says, uh, that, that the aorist is a sim is simple aspect. Right, right. Most well, that heck that is, okay? But anyway, since there's only a past tense of it in the indicative, people learn that the aorist just means I did it, okay? But that, that in a sense means it's perfect, right? You're, it, in English, we don't have this category. So, so it's, a, it's a real, it's a really, really difficult to get your head into the notion that you have a, you have a form which is, is really, just focusing on the action without specifying something about it, just right. as a lion isn't male or female. Do you know what I mean? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, and I think the so, triangle is a beautiful way to, to yeah. describe that situation, that exactly. relationship, right, between the exactly. marks and the mark. And so then, I mean, so then when we're starting to think about, let's say, we're reading the Iliad or we're reading some ancient Greek poetry, I mean, can you talk a little bit about the way that that can be used in order to make poetry and myth function do the things that it do 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 the yeah. things that it can do because it's this is really functional this is functional yeah. poetry it's it trying is. to change it the world right it is I mean I think I think um, you have a whole kind of um, aesthetic to the way you use for example the imperfect as a past tense and the aorist as a past tense in narrative in Greek poetry in Homer or other texts so mm -hmm. so that I think that that it's another way of thinking about unmarked forms is that they're the default. The default narrative tense is aorist, okay? Yeah. Um, and that means that the imperfect is, a, is, a, is in opposition to it and is a marked form and a restricted one. And so is the, so is the pluperfect, okay? Right. Um, if you want to think of it in those terms and the, uh, um, but, and the perfect. But I, I think whatever, you don't, you don't use perfect and pluperfect as narrative tenses in Greek. They're, they're something else, okay? But the aorist and the imperfect are continually in, in opposition to one another. And at a certain point in Greek, you also can use the present as a narrative tense, which is kind of mind-boggling to us. That's substandard in, in English to use the present as a, as a narrative tense. So the, the stuff like, so I says to him, that's bad right. English, right? That's right, right. Substandard English. So anyhow, uh, um, but so it becomes even more complex uh, at, at a certain point. But in, the, in in heroic poetry, the opposition is between imperfect and aorist, and the aorist is kind of just flat narrative. You're just describing what happened, and then bingo! All of a sudden, the you have the imperfect, which visualizes things. I think. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and which which slows things down, if you want, and uh, um, and and so. Um, a nice example of this is, for example, when uh, when a god or a goddess uh, uh, like Thetis, when she appears to Achilles, okay, she she uh, she she um, she does things like she comes in the aorist, but when she's sitting there, it's in the imperfect, okay. Sitting okay. next to him. Sitting next to them, him, okay. So and you use the particle of ra or ara with that. Right. With which we think is the visualization particle, right? right? So you can see that you have a coincidence between the notion of slowing the, the, the slowing the, the film down and asking you to visualize something, and also the way you use these these uh, different for, verb aspects to express the 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 highlighting of certain things or the slowing down of certain things, if you want. So in a very fundamental way, I mean, the use of this aspect is really affecting the way that the group uh, right. that is around and interacting with the performer right. is receiving it and, 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 um, and integrating visualizing it. Them as, as, they're, as, as you do. I mean, if you, you know, the, I think that's, it's a really crucial thing to think of narrative. Um, we, we don't have so much experience anymore of verbal narrative, right, mm -hmm. uh, without a person uh, uh, doing gestures and stuff like that. So verbal narrative, I mean, we do in our interactions with our family and friends, but in an artistic medium, we don't have it, right? right. Um, but but I, I think uh, uh, the, the closest thing in my experience was when I was a kid, radio was a big narrative medium, 
right, and, right. Uh, and and so you you learn to imagine in your head what 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 people were saying, the story they were telling you, and it's a very vivid thing because it's your it's it's your imagination that gets activated by the by the images. Whereas when our, our medium is film, and the images are all being fabricated for you, you you don't have an opportunity to do the imagining yourself. <laughs> right. right. Um, and so so these cues that point out things about the way the the action is being represented, I think, are very powerful. Um, in in a in a linguistic and a cultural system like that.